before the break will be uh, Pavel Safranov from UT Austin, and he will sp speak on Durazora constraints and Grinfeld Sokolov hierarchies. Thanks. Um, so, uh, this talk is about my paper on Durazora constraints and Grinfeld Sokolov hierarchies. Um, my goal was to understand uh, Durazora constraints that appear in closed string theory and quantum Riemann sources that appear in open strings. Well, I would still like to, to do that, but I decided to start with something simple, and that's um, understanding Durazora uh, constraints and Durazora Sokolov hierarchies. So these integral hierarchies appear in um, uh, spin gram witten theory and in its generalizations, uh, which are landau work models. So the first appearance uh, was in Witten's conjecture, which was that um, the partition function of 2D quantum gravity is a uh, tau function of the, of the corresponding Dirichlet Sokolov hierarchy. Okay. So the, let me explain how to construct Dirichlet Sokolov hierarchies and what they are. So to start, uh, you pick a Riemann surface. Let me assume that it's compact. So for example, you, you can start with the, with the Riemann sphere and pick a point, let's say infinity. Uh, then you have to choose a semi-simple group. I will choose SLN, which is again pretty simple. And finally, uh, an important piece of data is a maximal torus in the loop group. So uh, this is just some abelian group. For example, you can take loops into some fixed carton that's called homogeneous Heisenberg, or more common choice is the so-called principal Heisenberg subgroup. So I'll give some examples, um, but these are the common choices. Okay, so once you have chosen this data, uh, you can construct this phase space of this hierarchy as the moduli space of G bundles on this Riemann surface, which have a certain reduction to uh, this Heisenberg subgroup near the mark point. So let me explain th what this means uh, for SLN. So for SLN, you just have rank N vector bundles on your Riemann surface, so for, for example, on CP1. And a reduction to this homogeneous Heisenberg, LH, uh, this just means that you have an isomorphism between this vector bundle and a direct sum of line bundles near that point. So that's a pretty simple structure. And that's the phase space, it's just the moduli space of all such choices. Okay. And on that phase space, you have a residual action of um, the Heisenberg group, which is an abelian group, and it acts by changing the trivialization near infinity. Okay, and that, this action is what gives you uh, the, integral, the flows of the integrable hierarchy. By the way, this phase space has a symplectic structure. Well, in fact, it's a uh, Hamiltonian has several symplectic structures. Okay, so let me give an example. Um, so if you choose uh, your Riemann surface to be CP1 and the group is SL2 and the Heisenberg is the principal Heisenberg, then you can describe explicitly a certain open dense subspace of the phase space. Uh, it's given in terms of opers, which in this case is just second order differential operators of the form del squared plus u, where you use some function. So that's a pretty simple. So you can think of this differential operator as, as a coordinate on that phase space, on this open dense subspace. And then uh, during the cycle of flows, uh, which are given by this action of the Heisenberg, um, the, the corresponding vector fields give you differential equation, uh, certain differential equations on this function u. So for example, uh, the first flow is going to be trivial, but uh, the flow with respect to T2 gives you this differential equation, um, which is just the usual KDB equation. Okay. Uh, next, so I, I talked only about this open dense subspace. Uh, what, what you can d discover by looking at this equation is that certain solutions escape to infinity in finite time. So you want to compactify this phase space, and this Riemann Sokolov phase space gives you such a compactification. 
Okay, so now let me talk about a special classes of solutions. These will be algebra geometric solutions and string solutions. So let me start with algebra geometric solutions. Okay, uh, so suppose that your differential operator, which is called the lax operator in this context, uh, commutes with some other differential operator, and let me assume in this case that it's, it has odd order. So it will not always happen that you have such a differential operator, but let me assume that it does. Um, then the corresponding functions u are, are called algebra geometric solutions. So why they're called algebra geometric solutions is because, okay, you have two differential operators which commute, L and P, and you can look at the subalgebra inside of the algebra differential operators that is generated by them. So that's what I denote by C brackets L and P. That's this subalgebra, which is commutative subalgebra. And you can take its spectrum. Okay. So the spectrum was called the spectral curve. And you have a projection back to just spectrum of C brackets L, which is A1. So which is what, what your original curve is. So you have a projection from the spectral curve to your original base curve, which is CP1. Uh, moreover, if you have two commuting differential operators, you can look at the common eigenspectrum and common joint eigenfunctions in this case. And using this condition that P had order and L has an even order, you can see that in this case, um, you'll get the line bundle over the spectral curve. So the the spectrum is simple in this case. Okay. Uh, more general for Drimple Sokolov hierarchies, you can still make sense of the, this notion of being algebra geometric. So, one way to say that is that the action of the Heisenberg group, A, has a sufficiently big stabilizer. Another way to say that is that the corresponding orbit under the Heisenberg group is finite dimensional. So there are only finitely many non-trivial flows, non-trivial independent flows of this triple circle of hierarchy. Okay. And then there's a theorem uh, due to many people. So it started with Kruchever, then Mulasa, and then um, for more general triple circle of hierarchies, it's due to Benzweer and Freckle, is that you can completely recover uh, your original solution, if it was algebra geometric, from the corresponding spectral curve. So once you have a spectral curve and a line bundle over it, um, which has to satisfy a certain condition near the mark point, but let me just ignore it, uh, then you can recover your solution. So that's why it's called algebra geometric, because it's encoded in this algebra geometric object, which is a spectral curve and a line bundle over it. Okay. Uh, let me say a word about this certain ramification pattern. So if your Heisenberg was homogeneous, which is not the case for KDB, but it's the case for the nonlinear Schrodinger hierarchy, then this just means that your spectral curve can be branched, but not at infinity. At infinity, the condition is that it's completely unbranched, unramified. For the KDB hierarchy, it's the opposite case. Uh, at infinity, the condition is that the spectral curve is completely branched, completely ramified. Okay. And so the next class of solutions is the string solutions. So I mentioned this uh, Witten's solution, which appeared in 2D quantum gravity. It was the first solution which is not algebra geometric. Um, and this is a so called string solution. Okay. So before we looked at the equation L commutator with P zero, so you have some operator which commutes with L. Now let's look at the so-called string equation, which is the commutator of L and P is one. Now th this might, might look strange, but it looks somewhat like the while relation. So if L is your coordinate, then P is in some sense derivative with, that, with respect to that coordinate. Then uh, they commute to one. And the corresponding functions u will be called string solutions in the KDB case. Now, what I've done is I defined string solutions in this more general context of Dreamfield Sokolov hierarchies. So when you generalize it to 
arbitrary Riemann surfaces and arbitrary groups, arbitrary Heisenbergs, and so on. In this case, uh, you have an action of a certain Lie algebra, which contains the Dream for Sokolov flows, but it, it also allows you to change the Riemann surface. So it changes the complex structure on the Riemann surface. And it somehow couples uh, the Dream for Sokolov flows to this action of changing the Riemann surface. And now a solution is string if this action has a sufficiently big stabilizer. So I will not define precisely what this means, but this is somewhat similar to the definition of algebra generic solutions where you had a sufficiently big stabilizer under the Heisenberg group. Okay. And then the theorem, which is very close to this theorem Kruchever and other people, is that you can completely recover string solutions not from a spectral curve, but from a vector bundle with a flat connection in the SLN case. Or more generally, you get a G bundle with a flat connection. Um, so this is a, an actual statement which resembles appearance of quantum Riemann surfaces uh, in topological B strings, uh, in the B model of topological strings. So, okay. Uh, yeah, so, so one, one thing I should say is before we had this condition that the spectral curve has a certain ramification pattern near infinity, in this, uh, for the string solutions, uh, the connection has to preserve this reduction. So it has to have a special structure uh, near infinity and has to preserve that structure. Okay. Now, the final piece of data is tau functions. So let me define what these are. Okay, so in the, in the SL2 case, you just have a single function u, and your lax operator is an operator of degree 2. In the SLN case, you have an operator of degree n, so you have n minus 1 independent functions. So it might be hard to work with all of them. So you can instead encode this data of the solution, meaning all those functions u, into a single function tau, which is, um, in some sense, a generating function for your solution. And you can completely recover all those individual functions u from that tau function. Okay, so this is what happens in the KDB case, or more general SLN hierarchies. Uh, for Drinfeld Sokolov hierarchies, again, you can define this notion of a tau function. What happens is that there is a certain line bundle over the phase space, and for every section, you can look how non-invariant the section is under Drinfeld Sokolov flows. So the tau function measures non-invariance of the section under the flows. So I said that for every section you can construct this tau function. So in the KDB case, what, ha what turns out is that there's a one-dimensional space of sections of this line bundle. So there's a, there's a single tau function you can attach up to scale. And in physics, uh, these tau functions appear as some partition functions in closed string theories or in matrix models. Um, okay. Okay. So um, now let, let me talk about VR store constraints. So I would like to, s to prove that once you have a string solution, so a solution which is described by a flat, line, a flat vector bundle on your Riemann surface, which is an analog of a quantum Riemann surface uh, for open strings. For closed string partition functions, you get various order constraints. So let, let me explain what these are. So let me consider uh, the Lie algebra of vector fields on the Riemann surface, which are regular away from the mark point. So it can they can have arbitrary poles uh, near infinity. Okay. And you can construct uh, an action of this Lie algebra on the space of tau functions. So an, an important uh, part of this was to use the Sugawara construction. So the Sugawara construction allows you to not vary the curve. So you have a certain um, connection on the space of curves. 
which allows you to fix uh, tau function. Okay, so, so in the end, you get an action of this Lie algebra on the space of tau functions. So if you're working with a Riemann surface which is just CP1, that's just the negative part of your Verisor algebra. Okay. Now, this Lie algebra of vector fields on any Riemann surface is known to be simple. So it does not have any ideals. If you have a simple Lie algebra and you have a non-trivial representation, then the Lie algebra will embed into the endomorphisms of this representation. And so if you have an infinite dimensional Lie algebra, which is the case for any affine surface X, uh, then the Lie algebra will not have in any non-trivial finite dimensional representations. So in this case, the space of tau functions is finite dimensional, and you have this action of Verisora on that. So that means that this action of Verisora is actually trivial. And so you get this theorem uh, that once you have a string solution, so you have that flat G bundle, for the tau function, you get Verisora constraints. So you have an action of Verisora, and it fixes the tau function. And so here is an example um, which generalizes Verisora constraints for, in the case of quantum gravity. So if the group is SL2 and the curve is CP1, so the quantum gravity case corresponds to the Heisenberg being the principal Heisenberg. Here I wrote the formula for a more general Heisenberg. So you have several times Ti and Ti. In the, for the principal Heisenberg, I can be just a single number. So you have times, and this equation generalizes the string operator for the quantum gravity case. So tau, in that case, is the partition function of quantum gravity. Okay, and that's all I wanted to say. Thanks. Are there any questions? Uh, the Lie algebra of vector fields? Right, so um, you have uh, a connection on uh, this flat principal bundle. So a connection can be thought of as lift of vector fields to the principal bundle. So you, you lift your, your yes, uh, so it just gives you a kind of a parallel transport in this principal bundle. And so this action is precisely coming from that action, from that lift. From that, once you have that connection, you have a, an action of that Verisora algebra. Other questions? For a gender SLM, is there like a classification of all the possible Heisenberg? Uh, right, so uh, you can classify Heisenbergs up to LG conjugacy, conjugacy in, in LG, and there's a simple classification in general. Um, it's just given by conjugacy classes in the Weil group. Mm -hmm. And then there's a more complicated classification up to conjugation by the positive plug group. In that case, you, you can have different spectral curves. So, so basically, the classification is given in terms of formal spectral curves. So this is a very complicated classification, but for just up to LG conjugacy, is just conjugacy classes in the Weil group. So for example, the principal Heisenberg corresponds to the Coxeter element and the homogeneous Heisenberg corresponds to the trivial element. If there are no more questions, let's thank our speaker again.